Hello, I am Glenn Hall and today I am going to uh, Hello, I'm Glenn Hall and today is part six of my video series The Mystery of the Beast. Today's video is called The Beast Was Sold to Satan. I'm going to read several scriptures to you now and then I'm going to interpret those to you with the view that we can all begin to understand what the mystery of the beast is and begin to understand the times we live in and where we are in the times that we live in. Romans 7.14 says this, the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. It could say that we were sold to sin. If you will recall in the third video of this series, I told you that man is the beast. You are the beast. I am the beast. If we don't understand that, it will be very difficult, if not impossible, for, for us to understand what the mystery of the beast is. To understand this, we need to go all the way back to the beginning, all the way back to the very first book of the Bible, which is, of course, the book of Genesis. And there's several scriptures that I want to read today. First, let's look at Genesis 1, verse 26. Critical verse says this, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. It's critical to understand that God's plan and purpose is that mankind, that all of us would be conformed to his image. As I've said before, he created everything, all of the plants, all the animals, to reproduce after their own kind. Well, that's exactly what God was doing when he created man. He was reproducing after his own kind. Unfortunately, this is a, a doctrine that most men, most Bible teachers fear to even discuss. It's simply hidden from them that this is the, the purpose of God. Then, let's look at another scripture in chapter 2 of Genesis. 2.15 says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Take note of that. In the day that you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall surely die. And then go to chapter 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. The serpent was a beast. Notice that. And then from Genesis chapter 12, we understand that this serpent that appears here in Genesis was, in fact, Satan. So Satan was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree, that is the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. 
But the serpent said to the woman, You shall not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. God said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree, and I ate. Okay, this was the day that Adam, either this day or a day before this, would would not have been long before this, was the day that Adam ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, what did God say was going to happen on that day? God said, you shall surely die. Now, Adam was not, Adam and Eve were not aware of their nakedness until they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. What changed? I believe that Adam and Eve had what people have described as the Shekinah glory or a type of glory upon them, an angelic type of glory when they were created. And that there was no nakedness because they were clothed with the glory of God. Yet, when they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that evidently disappeared and they saw that they were naked. That's when they died. Well, wait a minute, you say. I mean, surely they're still alive, aren't they? They're talking to God, so they're alive, right? We must understand that in the scripture there are three deaths. This has to be understood or you can't, cannot understand the scripture. The three deaths are, and the first one is the one that Adam experienced on the day that he ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the death of the spirit. The second death that all men are called to die, and in fact which the Bible deals with, is the second death. And that's what we hear a lot about in the book of Revelation, the second death. But people have not understood it. The second death is the death of the soul. The death of the mind, the will, the emotions, this is what Jesus always talked about when he said, if you, if you save your life in this world, you're going to lose your life. In other words, if you spend this entire life acquiring things for your flesh, if you spend yourself only for the lusts of the flesh, then you have refused to die to the things of God. Or I should say, you have refused to die to the things of the world to accept the things of God. You have prioritized the things of the world instead of the things of God. So Jesus calls us to die to the things of the world, die with respect to our mind, our will, our emotions. They begin to take a back seat when we begin to really know the Lord and the things that the Lord teaches and is all about. So the second death is the death of the soul. 
The soul is who we think we are. When I say I want this or that, it's my soul that is speaking. The third death is the one that we usually um, think of when we think of death. And that's what everybody thinks of when they think that God told Adam on the day that he ate he would die. They were thinking that God meant his physical death. And so we make up things like, well, Adam lived till he was, I think, 960 years old or thereabouts. And um, that was, was within the first thousand years of creation. And with the Lord, a day is as a thousand years. So since he died within a thousand years, he died on the day that he ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That is true with respect to his physical body. And if we interpret the scripture that way, and sometimes we should interpret it that way. But I don't think that that's what God meant when he told Adam, on the day you eat, you shall surely die. Because on the day he ate, his spirit surely died. He was no longer a spiritual man. He was now a, a carnal man. He was now a man of the flesh. He was now a mere beast. So, continuing on. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me and I ate. The Lord God then said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. There again, we have this equating of Satan with a beast. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring, or your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. In other words, the offspring or the seed of man would bruise his head, but he would bruise the heel of the seed of mankind. But not only that, Satan was cursed to eat dust all the days of his life. Well, what, what is that that he was cursed to eat? Man. Man was made of the dust of the earth. So the curse upon Satan was that Satan would eat dust. Satan would eat man from then on. It's very sobering and very sick that cannibalism has now come much into the news and into the forefront. We're finding out that people involved with the deep state, people involved with those who have ruled the world for millennia. Participate in satanic sacrifice, which usually includes sexual perversion and cannibalism. Very sick. But yet that's the history of Satan worship. Think of the Mayans. When you do any research on the Mayans who were in Mexico and the Aztecs, you will find many instances of blood sacrifice, of the sacrifice of humans on their altars. You find that with the nations of Canaan before Israel took over that land under Moses. And then you even find it in Israel and Judah who sinned after they took the land. And so blood sacrifice, sacrificing children to Baal is very common. How common is cannibalism? It's usually kept very hidden. But God cursed Satan and said, you shall eat dust 
all the days of your life. Well, his life has not ended yet. His, his life has not ended yet. So, Romans 7.14 says, The law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. Well, now we go to Genesis chapter 4. 4 1 says, Now Adam knew Eve his wife. Knew is a euphemism for sexual intercourse. And she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of the sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering he had no regard. So Cain was very angry and his face fell. And the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why is your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. Now think about this. Was this idea, this concept of sin crouching at Cain's door? What was crouching at his door? Satan was crouching at his door ready to eat him when he could, whenever possible. And God told Cain, Satan's desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over him. This is setting the standard or the the idea, the plan of God, for his creation, for man. Now, many people think that God made a mistake when he created man because man so quickly sinned. Did did God not know that man was going to sin? Did God not know that this serpent that he created was going to tempt Adam and Eve? Of course he knew. So why did he allow it? Because it was his plan. God intended Adam and Eve to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Oh man, blasphemy. And that's what almost 100% of Christians would say, Christian teachers, because they've not understood and they've read wrong teaching about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. Remember, and this may be one of the few truthful things that Satan ever said, but remember he told Eve that They would become like God if they ate of it. Was that a lie? Well, let's look and see what God says. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 22, after he curses Satan, Adam, and Eve, then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Man did not know good and evil when he was first created. So he was not fully formed in God's image and likeness yet. See, it's a plan, right? It's like a baby. You have a baby. The baby is not fully formed into the image of the mother and the father when it's a baby. It has to be raised for many years until finally it can go and do the things that the mom and the dad can do. When God created man, he didn't simply 
only program him to do what was right without ever making a mistake. If he had done that, he would have created just an automaton, a robot that was programmed to only do the right thing. In order to be like God, you have to know good and evil and choose the good. You have to know good and evil and love the good and hate the evil. So going on in 22, Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever, Therefore the Lord God sent him out from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the Garden of Eden he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. So God did not dispute what Adam or what Satan said to Eve that you would become like God if you ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But it was then two things happened. Adam's spirit died so that he would not live forever and so that something would have to happen for that spirit to come back to life. Number two, Adam was sold to Satan. At that point, Satan became the ruler of the world instead of Adam. Now, how do we know? There's an abundance of scripture that talk about Satan being the ruler of the world. In Luke 4, 6, when he's tempting Jesus, Adam says, worship me and I will give you all of this power, all of this glory in the kingdoms of men. And he backs it up by saying, because all authority over the kingdoms of the world has been delivered to me. Well, when was that? It was delivered to Satan when men sinned and could no longer have dominion, take dominion over the earth. So Satan was given dominion over men at that time. And his goal was to, even though he didn't know this, his goal was to teach them the knowledge of good and evil. Now Satan, Satan wants to do with men exactly what God wants to do with men. Satan is always attempting to make men into his own image. Well, what's Satan's image? You can find this in Revelation chapter 22, verses 14 and 15. But basically, the image of Satan would be this. Number one, you're a liar. Number two, you're a murderer. Number three, you're covetous. Number four, you're lustful with all kinds of perverted sexual sin. Number five, you're given to drunkenness. Number six, you call good evil and evil good. Number seven, you practice sorcery, which is also magic and the use of drugs for illicit purposes. And eight, that you practice idolatry, that you worship a false god including Satan, because Satan, of course, tries to get everyone to worship him. So Satan is busy trying to create men in his image, whereas God's purpose is to make men into his image. Now, it sounds like an impossible case, doesn't it? I mean, what, can, what good now can happen?
Well, the scripture also tells us that from the foundation of the world, literally from before even the creation of anything, Christ was sacrificed for our sin. First, let's read 1 John 5, 19. <clears throat> John says, We know that we are from God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. That means the whole world lies in the power of Satan. Now let's go to First Corinthians fifteen verses twenty one and twenty two. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all shall be made alive. Okay, Paul very clearly says that every single human being has died in Adam. <clears throat> it's talking about spiritual death, obviously because none of us had been physically born or alive then. But in verse 22, he also says that everyone will be made alive in Christ. Keep that thought in mind. Now let's go to John 14, verse 30. Jesus is talking to his disciples. This is right before he is crucified and then resurrected from the dead. Jesus said, I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. He has no claim on me. Jesus established that Satan was the ruler of the world. He was coming. His hour had come to kill Jesus. But he didn't know what he was getting in for. Jesus says, he has no claim on me. What did that mean? That he had no claim on Jesus. Now let's go to Isaiah 52, verse 3. For thus says the Lord, you were sold for nothing, and you shall be redeemed without money. Mankind was sold to Satan for nothing. Adam sinned. Boom. Satan has possession. Satan is now the ruler of the earth. We were sold for nothing, but we will be redeemed without money. What does that mean? Let's go to First Peter chapter 1, verses 18 through 21. Peter says, Knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers. The word ransom is similar to the word redeemed. The idea of redeeming something at law means this. You can lose it because of foreclosure, because your taxes aren't paid, because you couldn't pay um, the bill to the bank. But in many states, there is a law that you can redeem your property if you do so within a certain amount of time. You can buy that property back. So even though you lost it, you can get it back if you pay the redemption price. That's we said to be redeemed. The property would be redeemed if you pay the redemption price. So Peter says, knowing that you were ransomed, or redeemed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things like silver or gold. In other words, we weren't redeemed with money. Verse 19, but 
with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. We were redeemed by the precious blood of Christ. That's a mystery that I still do not understand. But the scripture says the life is in the blood, the soul is in the blood. The book of Hebrews says that everything at the temple was sanctified by blood, by the shedding of blood. In a mystery, the blood of Jesus Christ was somehow sprinkled upon the mercy seat, the actual mercy seat in heaven, whereby mankind was redeemed. Mankind was ransomed from the power of Satan. First Peter 1.20 goes on, He was foreknown before the foundation of the world was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you. Let me read that again. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Then Ephesians 1, 7 says, In him, in Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. And then Colossians 1, 12 through 14, Paul says, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness, that is from Satan's kingdom, and he has transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So we have redemption in Jesus Christ. We are redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And that redemption takes us from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of light. Are you beginning to see now that this redemption is large in scope? way bigger than anything you've been told in the past. Remember, 1 Corinthians 15 says, as in Adam, all die. And we've seen that all have died. All are subject to sin and death. But Christ died for the redemption of all. And then, Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 through 15 says this, And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses, by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. This redemption applies to all men. Remember part one of this series was called The Most Reviled Man in All the Earth. And I showed you that Jesus Christ is the most reviled man in all the earth. The reason why is because Satan and those who work for him spend all of their time trying to keep everyone in the dark. The scripture makes it clear that the redemption is for all. It's already done. Christ has already paid the price for your redemption. problem is that since Satan continued to rule the earth, 
He had the ability to craft all kinds of deceitful lies that have kept mankind in ignorance. Number one, of God's creation of them. Number two, of their fall into sin. And number three, of the remedy, which is Jesus Christ. He redeemed us so that we are no longer under the curse of the law and no longer under the curse of sin and no longer under the curse of the jurisdiction of Satan. But people don't understand that. It's like if you have a jail filled with people and you open the door and say, you're free. You can, you can leave now. If they are so mind controlled, if they are so deceived by everything that they hear, that they think that that cell door is still closed, they will not try to leave. They remain subject to prison and to the guard of that prison, even though they have been set free. The same is true for every single one of us. We've already been set free. That's why this idea of faith is so important. You just have to believe that Jesus Christ really did that. That's why in some scriptures, it seems that that's the only thing you need to, to have, that you only need to believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins. Because if you truly do believe that, you will walk out of the dominion of darkness and you will come into the kingdom of light. Mankind was sold to Satan because of Adam's sin. The law, Paul says, is a tutor that leads us to Christ. The law is what teaches us right and wrong. It teaches us the knowledge of good and evil. God wants us to know the law. He wants us to know what is good and he wants us to know what is evil. He wants us to choose the good and get rid of the evil. Satan, Satan's role in all of this was to present evil to us. And now evil is on such display Sin is on such display that, as the scripture says, it has become utterly sinful. Now, even people who are still engaging in a lot of sin are walking away from it. Can you grasp what I'm saying? People who are still engaged in incredible sin like homosexuality, transgenderism, adultery, abortion, are walking away from the evil that they see in the deep state. Now, as this revelation unfolds, I am going to introduce more concepts and ideas that describe exactly what the deep state is. But I believe that this particular video is going to help a lot of you begin to walk away from the evil that has controlled this earth for millennia. And it's going to help a lot of you who have walked away to begin to change your mind even about the sins that you're still committing 
so that you will continue to walk toward the light, toward the truth that is Jesus Christ, the one who shed his blood for you, for me, who redeemed us from the power of Satan, who bought us back to the one that God had sold us to, to be his treasured possession, God's treasured possession. That's who we are now. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of light. I pray that God will give you understanding of these things and help you on your way to become molded and conformed to his image, to the image of Christ. That's what the entire Bible is about, being conformed to the image of our Creator.